Jean-Pierre Demailly euh, de l'Université Grenoble, Alpes, et de l'Académie des sciences, un des, des, euh, des grands géomètres contemporains, euh, qui va nous parler, nous entretenir de « Analytic Solutions to Algebraic Equations » and a conjecture of Kobayashi. So please, Jean-Pierre. Okay, um, thank you very much, Jacques. So I'm, I'm very glad to be again in Montreal, although it's only virtually. I would like to thank Jack for the invitation to this uh, seminar de mathématiques. So um, I will discuss um, algebraic equations and uh, entire analytic solutions in relation with the existence, uh, for instance, of uh, rational points. So it's quite related to number theory as well. I will start with very, very elementary stuff. So I apologize for those who, of course, know this since a very long time. Okay, so um, Diophantine equations, of course, have been uh, studied since a very long time, even before the Greeks. So uh, you see here a Babylonian tablet, uh, going back almost uh, two millenaries before Christ, uh, showing a Pythagorean triples. And of course, uh, there are uh, triples of integers such that uh, a square plus b square equals c square, representing uh, rectangular triangles. And um, in that case, uh, you have a, a general form of the solution, which is just written in red here, uh, with arbitrary integers k, p, and q. So this is a basic formula that you study probably at the end of high school or beginning of university. Um, and in fact, uh, you can reinterpret this immediately in terms of uh, analytic curves because, well, the curve involved, if you divide by c square, uh, you get the circle, x square plus y square equal one. And in that case, uh, the solution now, uh, you divide a by c, b by c, and then if you reparametrize in terms of, uh, of the ratio t equal q over p, then you get one of the standard parametrizations of the circle, uh, which is of course a complex analytic solution if you take uh, the circle as a complex curve. So allowing x and y to be complex numbers. And uh, in that way, of course, taking t to be a rational number, you get a lot of rational points. Okay, and in general, uh, when you, you study algebraic geometry, uh, you are usually very interested in rational curves. So if you have a plane, uh, a plane curve given by a polynomial equation Txy equals zero with integer coefficients, uh, assume that you have a parameterization of solutions in the form of uh, rational functions, x equal r of t over q of t, y equal v of t over u of t, again with integer coefficients. And then if this happens, then you get infinitely many rational points simply by taking uh, rational values of the parameter t. And uh, the important issue here is that you actually have a rational parameterization. Uh, it is convenient to work with complex numbers because you are in an integrally closed field and uh, things usually go much better. Uh, well, at least they are simpler than uh, over other fields like the real numbers, for instance. Um, if you have a homogeneous polynomial equation, p, x, y, z equals zero, uh, then of course you can consider that you are working in the complex projective plane. Uh, so you, you identify points that are collinear points in C3, and then you get the projective plane. And uh, here in my setting, um, uh, Z equals zero represents the point at infinity of the projective plane. Well, this is quite standard, I guess. I don't have to explain much more. Uh, and in, in general, when you have conics, uh, you can simply fix a point, okay? You fix a point and then you parameterize uh, by a line, the line will intersect an, in another point. And this uh, intersection uh, with a line, uh, you can say the slope is t, 
and this will give you a parameterization of the conic. And it works with arbitrary plane conics. And in fact, as soon as uh, the real points are done in T, and there is at least one rational point, then you have infinitely many rational points in that case for uh, degree two. So now let, let's go to one degree further, so uh, cubics. So if you have a non-degenerate -de -de cubic, uh, you can always uh, find a projective transform that puts it under the reduced form y square equal x cubed plus ax plus b. So this is the standard form of uh, elliptic curves. Um, and if you add, if you add the point at infinity, uh, then actually what is very interesting is that you get a group, a group structure, which uh, gives an isomorphism uh, in terms of a bilomorphic map between the quotient of C by a lattice uh, and the group structure is the additive structure. And here you see what is the uh, addition law. So you take a line, it intersects in three points, P, Q, R. You take the symmetric of R, which is R prime, and then the addition law is that P plus Q equal R prime. And then you have to add the point at infinity, which is the, uh, the zero back then. And in that case, uh, there is a well-known uh, transcendental uh, representation in terms of the Weierstrass P function. And uh, if you put X equal P of T and Y equal P prime of T, the derivative of the Weierstrass function, uh, they are a neuromorphic uh, lambda periodic uh, functions of the parameter t and c, and then you get uh, essentially a, a, a very nice parameterization of the elliptic curve. And uh, it can be shown, and this is uh, already a non-trivial result, that if you have an elliptic curve that is defined over the rationals, so with a and b rational, then the rational points form a finitely generated abelian group. Uh, it's already a highly non-trivial subject because it's not even known whether this, the rank of this uh, abelian group can be unbounded. It's widely expected to be unbounded and there's the uh, swinner von Dyer mm, mm, conjecture that uh, tells more about this, but I, I'm not entering into this uh, kind of subject. Okay. and. Now to, to end uh, my presentation with curves, of course, you have a uh, classification of curves, also same as Riemann surfaces in three types. Uh, <clears throat> so you have positive curvature, genus zero, this is the sphere, I mean non-singular curves here. And then genus one, the curvature can be uh, taken to be flat with a suitable metric. Uh, these are the elliptic curves, and then higher genus, uh, larger than one, and then um, they have negative curvature. In other words, the canonical, uh, the canonical bundle is positive. And that's it for curves. And uh, that's not finished, of course, for the, um, the understanding of rational points, even for curves, because, well, there is a general theorem now, which is uh, the solution by Gerd Feltings of the Mordel conjecture. So Feltings got the Fields Medal in 86 for this solution. And the result is that if you have a smooth curve of genus at least two in the complex projective plane, uh, defined over the rational numbers, then uh, the curve has only finitely many rational points. And the proof is highly, highly non-trivial. Um, now let's go to uh, arbitrary dimension N. So now we are looking at uh, projective varieties. So I denote here by PNC the capital N dimension projective space over the complex numbers, and a uh, subvariety capital X defined by some homogeneous polynomials, PJ. And then uh, 
a crucial concept is the concept of pericanical sections. So you define in that case the canonical bundle. This is the top, top exterior power of the cotangent bundle. And now you take the nth tensor power of Kx and you look at the global sections. So in other words, they are objects of the form a holomorphic function f z1 of zn in terms of coordinates times a top form zz1 wedge etc wedge zzn raised to some uh, tensor power m and you require that this glues over the various charts of the uh, of the variety if if it is non singular and then you have the concept of kodaira dimension kappa of x which can take values minus infinity, zero, one, up to uh, complex dimension M, which measures, so it measures the gross, the gross here as, as M goes to infinity. Okay, so you uh, take the log of the dimension, divide by log M, so essentially it's a degree of gross, so uh, it's always an integer. You take the lint soup of this, it's always an integer, but you may have not, uh, only zero section. Uh, if you have only zero, of course, log is minus infinity, and then you get the nice infinity dimension. Okay, I will be interested here in those varieties, uh, so called varieties of general type. So this means that the, the Kodaira dimension is maximal. So it means that you have many, many uh, holomorphic um, top forms, well, powers of top forms, okay? The growth is maximal. And in fact, you can translate this in terms of uh, differential geometry. Uh, it's equivalent, in fact, to the existence of a singular metric H on the, uh, canonical bundle with strictly positive curvature in the sense of currents. So uh, you can define the Ricci curvature, it's a singular version of the Ricci curvature. You simply take in coordinates uh, i over two pi del del bar of log h. So you take derivatives v2 over dzj dzk bar of your function log of h of z. So you get a Hermitian matrix and this Hermitian matrix uh, will be strictly negative in the sense of distributions here, because you, you may have singularities. And in fact, you can show that this is completely equivalent to the fact that the variety is of general type. So you can translate somehow to a complex differential geometry. And a very well-known fact is that if you take a non-singular hypersurface. So here you take a single polynomial, not, not many equations as here, you take only one equation given by a homogeneous polynomial of n, sorry, it should be n plus one here. Okay, S then uh, you get an n-dimensional hypersurface. It will be of general type if and only if the degree of this polynomial is at least n plus three. And if it is just uh, n plus two, in fact, uh, it's also a very interesting object. It's called the Calabi-Yau manifold. Uh, it will be of uh, zero Ricci curvature. So in fact, the, um, the Ricci curvature in that case, you compute here the sign, the sign of the Ricci is in fact the same as the sign of uh, n plus two minus d. So if d is small, you have positive Ricci. If d is equal to n plus two, you have zero. And if d is larger than n plus two, uh, then it will have negative Ricci. So this uh, I will not compute, but that's, that's computed by elementary arguments of uh, complex differential geometry. And I am coming to uh, 
more recent uh, results, uh, namely uh, the existence of rational and elliptic curves. So the question is whether you can find, can, can, you, can one find, can one find such curves in a given uh, projective variety X? Okay, and I will be uh, interested mostly um, in hypersurfaces. Okay, so I take X here to be defined by a single polynomial, P of Z, written at sum of A alpha Z alpha equals zero. And then it will be a non-singular. I, I, I take it to be generic. So first I assume it's non-singular and you have to exclude uh, possibly a discriminant locus. But in fact, what uh, Clemens, uh, Voisin and Pacenza have proved is that if you take the hypersurface to be generic, so if you remove a, a large uh, algebraic set in the space of coefficients, then what you get is a, uh, is a variety such that all algebraic subvarieties are of general type. So not only, uh, and the degree has to be large enough, two n plus one. So I said before that if you have n plus three, then x will be of general type. And now you have a stronger result that not only x is of general type, but also all algebraic of variety y. And in case y is singular, it means that uh, the desingularization is of general type. This is what you mean. So the, the original proofs were not so easy. And then finally, Pierre Voisin found a very easy proof of this. So I will not enter into this. Uh, and a consequence is that in particular, uh, such a uh, hypersurface with a large enough degree has no rational or elliptic curves. And especially if you remember what I said at the beginning, okay, there will be no rational functions or Weierstrass type transcendental function F looking like the Weierstrass P function, which are solutions of your polynomial equation. Okay, now uh, we go to a more ambitious uh, question. So this is a so-called Kobayashi conjecture. Uh, which was raised by Shoshiki uh, Kobayashi in the 70s. So now you take a hypersurface, uh, which you assume again to be generic and of large degree. Uh, D is supposed to be at least Dn and Dn, Dn is large, okay? We, we will be interested later to to find explicit values of the end. Um, and then the conjecture was that uh, such a hypersurface contains no anti-holomorphic curve, not constant, uh, so such that P of F of T is zero. So not only you don't have a Weierstrass function, but you don't have any entire analytic solution. Uh, in fact, by the previous results that I mentioned, and also, uh, of course, the well-known facts from Riemann Poincaré on, on curves, uh, this bound that was uh, stated before uh, for a, uh, the subvarieties of general type are also expected to hold for the um, for the non-existence of entire curve. So you expect exactly the same bounds. So uh, for, for curves in P2, uh, it should be degree four, because of course, degree three of elliptic curves uh, uh, doesn't work, but starting from degree four, they should be uh, hyperbolic. Uh, and the bound should be two N plus one for N equal two, three, four, and DN should be two N for N at least five. So this would be the optimal uh, degree. And now I come to an even more difficult uh, conjecture, uh, the so-called Green-Griffiths-Nan conjecture. 
So now you take a projective variety, absolutely arbitrary, and uh, you assume it is of general type. So it needs the Kodaira uh, dimension of X, which kappa is uh, N. Then there should exist a proper algebraic subvariety Y that contains all holomorphic entire curves F that are drawn into X. Okay, so there should be a locus, uh, a locus Y that contains all the entire curves. And uh, by definition, uh, the smallest Y uh, is usually called the exceptional locus of X. So of course, it, it always exists because you can take the intersection, uh, the intersection of all algebraic variety that contain all the entire curves. And by notarianity, uh, this intersection is again algebraic. And therefore, it's the smallest uh, locus. Uh, and now, there is a very, very uh, interesting, but probably extremely hard conjecture in number theory, which would be the arithmetic counterpart of the green griffiths line conjecture. Uh, now, suppose you are in the arithmetic situation. So you, you take X, a projective variety, uh, defined over a number field, K0. So a finite extension of the, uh, the rationals. And then you have the exceptional locus, which I just introduced, which is related to the entire curves. And then the green, the, uh, the, the, the one from the Green-Griffiths line conjecture. And then the statement is that this should be equal to a so-called Mordelic locus. And the Mordelic locus is the smallest y, again, you take the intersection of all the y's, for which if you consider all number fields, uh, K that contain your initial K zero, then the points in K should be finite, except possibly those which sit on Y. Okay, so in other words, maybe I, I try a picture. So you have your X here, you have a Y here, and on this Y, you might have a lot of points, a lot of points, infinite number of points in your number field X of K, so uh, over the, the, uh, the number field K. But outside of this locus, you might have only five too many, so very few, okay? And Y is the smallest with this property. And the claim now is that this arithmetic locus Y precisely coincides with the locus uh, of the entire curve. So there should be a very, very strong uh, relation between the uh, entire holomorphic curves and this uh, arithmetic locus. Uh, there is little evidence except that it would make things very nice. And it would be, of course, a very wide generalization of Felting's theorem. And for the rest of this talk, I will now uh, not consider any more the uh, arithmetic considerations, uh, but will concentrate on entire curves because it's already uh, hard enough. Uh, so uh, let me discuss now the Kobayashi conjecture. Conjecturally, uh, Kobayashi has uh, expected the, the following, uh, following statement. So if you take a complex projective algebraic variety X, then you say it's Kobayashi hyperbolic precisely if it doesn't possess any non-constant entire curve um, from C to X. Well, in fact, this is a, a theorem by Brody that, well, Kobayashi gave a slightly different definition. Um, 
this definition can be seen to be equivalent in the projective case to the non-existence of entire curve. So it's not exactly the definition, but it's a, uh, it's a not, not very difficult statement. So I will take this as, as my definition. Okay. And then this property of non-existence of entire curves is expected to be equivalent to the fact that every subvariety is of general type. And in fact, the, the most significant implication, which would be uh, going from the algebraic characterization to the analytic statement, uh, that would be an immediate consequence of the green griffiths line conjecture. Because then you argue by induction, so X is of general type, so there should be a locus by green griffiths line. But then this locus is again uh, of general type because this is your assumption. And then by induction on dimension, it doesn't have any entire curve. So you're done. And um, the other implication, well, it's probably easier, but still unknown at this point. Um, it's expected to come from a better understanding of so-called special varieties. For instance, they were defined by uh, Campana and other people. Um, well, but it's still, still unknown. Um, and a basic observation is that if you have, of course, the very strong green griffiths line conjecture, then, of course, the results I mentioned by Clemens Boisna Pacienza would imply the Kobayashi conjecture with the optimal bounds. Uh, but, of course, it would be very nice to have the green griffiths line conjecture, but it's so hard that uh, we have to do something else uh, and try to prove directly the Kobayashi conjecture. So this is what I'm going to explain now. OK, so let me uh, start with a brief history of results on the Kobayashi conjecture. So one of the first results, starting from dimension two, was obtained by uh, McQuillan, myself, and my former PhD student, El Ghul, in 98. So you take a surface in complex projective space P3 of degree at least 21 and with generic coefficients. And then actually it is hyperbolic. Uh, independently, McQuillan got degree at least, well, the result for degree at least 35. But, well, it's, it's only a matter of exercising more care in the, in the estimate. Um, I will not really go into that proof, but it, let me say that it uses uh, so-called jet bundle technology and uh, results of McQuillan on curve foliations on surfaces. And the bound was uh, gradually improved. And I think the best known bound at this point is uh, 18 by Town, uh, 2008. for surfaces. And now for arbitrary dimension, for arbitrary dimension N, uh, it was announced in 2012 by Yung Tong Su that the Kobayashi conjecture holds uh, with a non-explicit value of the bound DN. Okay, so you, you want uh, hyperbolicity for, for X, or if you have X, X, which is of dimension N now in n plus one, well, complex numbers, and you take this x to be generic, okay, generic coefficients. It's just given by one single equation. So you, you mean here that the, uh, the coefficients of your polynomial are generic, and then you take the degree, the degree larger than dn, then it should be uh, hyperbolic, so no entire curve. Uh, well, the proof was long, uh, very intricate, and hard to understand. And so more, uh, more conceptual proofs were needed. And in fact, in, in 2016, a uh, young guy, uh, Damien Brebeck, who's now got a professor position in uh, uh, Polytechnique, 
he got a, a more geometric and more conceptual proof of the Kobayashi conjecture. Um, he gave a proof that I will try to explain, although I will present a, a simplification of it. Uh, and in his original proof, again, uh, the bound was not explicit, but very shortly afterwards, actually three weeks later, my PhD student uh, Yadeng uh, realized that by adding some arguments, you could turn uh, Brodbeck's proof into an effective uh, version and get the following explicit value of the, of the degree bound. So dn is essentially uh, something like n to the 2n plus 6. So it's very large. So I should say that uh, this is, of course, very far from the linear bounds uh, because we expect essentially 2n, uh, which is much smaller. Uh, there is a claim uh, by using different methods uh, about one year and a half ago by um, Frances Kirwan and uh, Desjali Berksy for polynomial bounds. So this is a very big achievement and they, they use for this uh, very deep techniques of uh, non-reductive uh, group present representations. But since this is a colloquium talk, I want here to uh, try to give a very simple argument. So I will not enter into this, uh, into this approach, but hopefully uh, we have now a polynomial, uh, polynomial bound. Okay, so now I, I'm going to tr try to give you a very elementary argument for the Kobayashi conjecture with a bound which is a bit weaker than the previous bound, uh, exactly this one. So essentially n to the 2n plus 2, and here e is exponential 1. Okay. So what is the proof? Well, the proof is based on using certain algebraic differential operators. So I will denote them by q of f. So they F, F here is either an entire curve or it could be it could be just a germ because uh, this is local or germ. So you take a small disk here uh, in one variable. So you take a small analytic disk and then uh, you look at operators of this form. So they, they are polynomials in terms of the derivatives. Of course, you, you write this in coordinates. So you, you take coordinates. And then in coordinates, you simply write your, your curve as an interval. And then what I mean here, of course, uh, when I write this f prime to the alpha one, I mean actually a monomial in the first derivative. So something alpha one one here, al the second alpha one two, etc. F, F prime n, alpha one n, etc. So I, I write like this to make the notation simple. So I have a I have monomials in the first, second, and case derivatives of F, and a holomorphic coefficient here that depends on the value of, of f. So this is the sort of algebraic differential operators I want to consider. And additionally, I want the coefficient here to vanish on some ample hyperplane sections A. Okay, so my coefficients are not random. I have some hyperplane section A here, ample hyperplane section. Uh, I want my coefficients to be zero here on, the, on this A. Okay, so this is the sort of differential operators I want. Uh, I will denote such operators so they form actually a bundle 
I will denote by EKM this bundle. And here, this is, means that they vanish on A, okay? Uh, and K, K is the order. So it's a number of derivatives. You, have, you go up to derivative FK. And M is the degree. So what is the degree? It's actually the number of primes. So here, this counts for two primes. So you have to multiply by two. So you take alpha one plus two alpha two plus K alpha K. Um, you, you take only homogeneous such polynomials. So this is the weighted degree. And it, it turns out that this degree is intrinsic. It doesn't depend on coordinates. So it, it's a globally defined independent of coordinates. Okay, and now you have a very fundamental vanishing theorem, which was essentially observed by Green and Bufis in 1790. Uh, with a slightly incomplete proof that I completed in 95 and also assumed and Young in 96. But the main idea was there. Um, if you have such a differential operator Q, so you take such a Q here, then automatically any global entire curve uh, must satisfy the, uh, the equation. So it's a bit surprising. It's a bit surprising. S somehow, without knowing what is F, you simply look at the uh, algebraic differential operators and you know that the, the curve will be solution of them. And now the strategy is that instead of just one equation, you may want to find a lot of equations, qj of f. And if, you are, if they are independent enough, then of course, uh, you might be able to show that the only solution uh, of those equations is uh, f of a, a constant, and then you're not. So this is what you want. In fact, you want to show that on your variety, you have many uh, global differential operators, uh, and you have to know that they are independent enough. So this is the point. Um, it might not be a necessary and sufficient condition, of course. Uh, it's a sufficient condition to exclude uh, entire curves, but maybe not necessary. Okay, let me give some hints of the proof. Uh, in fact, you have a well-known lemma, which is called Brody's lemma, which is that when you have a, an entire curve, so it may accumulate, of course, you are in a compact manifold. You are in a compact manifold. So your curve has to accumulate somewhere. And if it accumulates, it turns out that you can take small parts, maybe in, in blue, okay, you have small parts, and then the small parts they will converge to something else. So you start, you start from a curve, F, and by taking in the cluster set, you are going to find a new one, uh, which will still be defined over the whole complex plane by taking dilations here. You have, you have disks, but you take larger and larger disks. But now the main thing is that the derivative will be bounded. So in fact, every time you have a, an entire curve, you can find another one with bounded derivative. It's a bit surprising. So it's a very easy uh, one variable uh, lemma. It's called a Brody curve uh, when you have a bounded derivative. And now somehow it's enough to prove the vanishing theorem for Brody curve. So you assume, you assume that your curve has bounded derivative. So F prime is bounded. Okay, you can assume A to be very ample by going to a multiple. Uh, and then it's well known that, that when you have a holomorphic function, if it's bounded, the derivatives are also bounded on disks. But because you assume F prime to be bounded, then all derivatives are bounded. 
But now you're on a compact manifold. And so when you compute your polynomial in, in the derivatives, the derivatives are bounded, the coefficients are bounded because you're on a compact manifold, so your function is bounded. But now by Liouville's theorem, it must be constant. But you know that your coefficients vanish on A, and then you can move A because it's very ample, so you can assume that A hits your curve, and then your function is bounded and vanishes somewhere, so it's constant and vanishes, and therefore is zero. That's the proof. Um, now, if you have an arbitrary entire curve, then it's not much more difficult. I will not go into details. Uh, you can use instead the maximum principle in the form of the Elfors lemma. It's not much more difficult. So it's a, it's a rather easy theorem. Okay, and now I come to the, uh, the main core of the simplified proof of the Kobayashi conjecture. So as you will see, it's not very hard. So suppose, suppose you, you pick a line bundle on your manifold, any line bundle, arbitrary. And suppose you take sections. So of course, to get sections, you're, you're going to assume usually L to be ample. Okay, so you take K plus one sections, arbitrary, global. Okay, and then uh, you define Vronskian operator like this. So it depends on, on the given sections S0, SK. So I denote it by W of S0, SK. Uh, so this is my operator Q here, acting on F. You of course, you have to take a trivialization. You locally, your bundle is trivial. So it's, you can view uh, the sections just in the trivialization. You can view them as a holomorphic functions. So you could as well take a zero SK to be holomorphic functions. Okay, and then you compute uh, the usual Vronskian in terms of this determinant of uh, the derivatives of the SJ of F. So you have a square matrix here of size K plus one. Um, and it turns out that it's actually independent of the trivialization because you have a determinant, okay? So it's a small calculation that this thing computed in any trivialization of the bundle actually gives you an, invari well, an invariantly defined uh, differential operator, which has total degree k, k plus one over two, because you count a number of derivatives. So if you take a typical, a typical term, so it's a diagonal say, so you have one derivative, he, uh, zero derivative here, and then one derivative here, then two derivative, then k derivative. So you have one plus two plus k. So the total degree is k k plus one over two, which I denote by k prime. So this is my order, and this is the degree. Okay. Which I, I denoted by n. And actually, if if the sections are with values in L, of course you multiply things that are intuitively are in L, so you get something which take value in L to the K plus one. And in fact, this is intrinsically defined and you get a global differential operator that way with values in L to the K plus one. But then you wonder it's useless because the vanishing theorem, the vanishing theorem is not for something like this, it's for something negative. So if you have something negative here, you would get the vanishing theorem. But here, if you want sections, you probably, you probably want 
L to be ample, namely uh, with positive curvature, you have a lot of sections, so you want exactly the opposite. So you, you do produce uh, differential operators, but not once that you will be able to apply the previous theorem. Uh, the, the vanishing theorem will not apply to, to the Vronskians. Okay, so it seems useless. However, and that's my next observation, sometimes you can make simplifications, you can divide. And by dividing, you can get um, the negative powers that you need. Okay, let me give you an example. So, suppose you are on projective space, your bundle is just a topological O of one, which is of course very ample. You take K to be less than the uh, total dimension. You take the degree to be at least two K and you take your sections to be of the following form. So they, they are of degree, total degree, uh, degree of as J is D. So you have a large, a large power of ZJ, a coordinate, times a polynomial of degree K. And then of course you get a, a, a degree D polynomial. Okay, if you take this, of course, when you take derivatives of order L, uh, when you differentiate, of course, uh, this will be differentiated. And then uh, each time you differentiate, degree decreases by one. But you are going to uh, take derivatives of order less than K. And then this degree remains always larger than D to, D to uh, ZJ to D minus two K. But then it means that your Vronskian, you can divide because all derivatives are uh, divisible by these coordinates. So you can divide and then you get something. So here your, your line bundle is A to the D. So you get something into L to the K plus one, which is A to the D K plus one. But then you have to remove you, you simplify it k plus one times, so k plus one times d minus two k. Okay, and then you get something, well, you were expecting to have something negative, you still don't have. However, it doesn't depend anymore on the degree d. It's constant, depending only on k. So if you would be able to have one more factor, one more factor, Z something to the D minus K and D very large could become negative. Okay, so this is just what I explained. If you have one more factor, it might work. Okay, so now, of course, it cannot work on projective space. No, it's not surprising that you don't succeed on projective space because a projective space, of course, has a lot of entire curves. So you cannot succeed to produce the differential operators because you would prove that PN has no entire curves and it cannot be. It cannot be. So you cannot succeed on PN. However, just take this hypersurface. So you take the sum of your terms here, the sum of the SJ of Z, so this is the sum uh, from j equal zero to capital N of zj to the d minus k times uj, uj of z equals zero. And then you look at, at your Vronskian, but then you replace here S zero. Of course, the sum of Sj is zero. So you can replace S zero by minus the sum of the others. So here you replace, you replace S zero by minus the sum, but because it's a determinant, it's alternate. 
and therefore you get plus or minus one times W of Sn. Remember that K is less than N. Uh, actually, I'm going to take K equal to N minus one here. So if I precisely take K to be N minus one, then this way I get an extra term by which it will be divisible. And now it works. So it means, it means that on all those hypersurfaces, on all those hypersurfaces, I have one more factor by which I can divide. And now I get something which will be negative if D is large. So I have succeeded, I have succeeded producing one global algebraic differential operator, which is simply a Vronskian, which takes values in a negative in a negative power here of the line bundle provided provided d is large unfortunately one equation as i suggested is still not enough you want a lot and uh, a very simple idea well the original proof by Brodbeck was by using some sort of non-effective argument, um, using riemann rohr and complicated stuff. And I realized uh, two years later that actually you can produce explicitly um, such uh, equations simply by taking a better choice of a better choice of the polynomial here. Okay, so what is this choice? Um, Okay, so the choice is you, you are going to take um, a sum here of more or less random polynomials, which I denote by AI of rather large degree. And then uh, here, some, um, some sort of monomials raised to high powers. So the mi are monomials. What are these monomials? I take, so now I am here in pn plus one, okay? And then I take some arrangement of hyperplanes. So I have a lot, an enormous number of hyperplanes, which are given by some linear forms, tau j, of z equals zero. Okay, so there are simply hyperplanes. And now I arrange this in a combinatorial way. In fact, the index j runs over all subsets of a, a given set of large, large number. And I take all sets of cardinal small n. And I take the monomials to be the product for all sets J that contain a given index I. So it's just a combinatorial. So I take some, some product of a, of a subset of, of the hyperplanes to produce the monomials. And then I add up large powers of these monomials, which are just a product of some of the hyperplanes and I, I take this. Okay, it looks strange, it looks strange. Mm, well, you have to, to take it to be smooth. And in fact, it's not very hard. Well, it's simply enough to take enough here terms. So you simply take capital N to be N times N plus one, and then you will get something smooth generically. Not very hard. And then it turns out that you can construct a lot of Ronskians. So here, well, this is somehow junk. Uh, I, may need, I may need some extra terms. I put essentially arbitrary terms, uh, just arbitrary linear forms. So this, don't pay attention to this. Now I take my terms here, but not all of them. I exclude, I exclude exactly N of them. So this is, this is, all terms except 
a subset, subset J of cardinal small n. So almost all of, almost all terms except n. And then exactly with the same argument, you take derivatives. So when you take derivatives, if they, the exponent decreases by k, and as this will be divisible by the mi to the delta minus k, and you still get something uh, positive. So you, you want one more. But then you use the same argument, you replace one of them by minus the sum of the others, and it turns out that by your choice here of the monomials, you will have one, comma one common factor in the other terms. So you will get one extra dividing factor. And now if delta is large, if delta is larger than the, this thing plus, uh, plus k, it turns out that this extra term will produce a negative exponent. But now, because you have so many choices, you have so many choices of the random stuff here and uh, any choice of the subsets, you get an extremely large number of, wrong, of different wrong scans. And you can hope that with this very large number of different wrong scans, you're going to be able to say something. So this is the... Uh, the trick. Of course, there is some combinatorics behind that is a bit tricky, so I, I cannot tell you much more. I have only three or four minutes left. So now I'm going to explain the basic idea, which is the geometric construction. Okay, so in fact, Vronskians play a very important role. So you now you can consider local Vronskians. So instead of, of global sections, you can take just germs. So you, it's just the same formula. You take germs of holomorphic functions. You can still define uh, Vronskians. And then you, you take the polynomial algebra. You take the polynomial algebra generated by the Vronskians of order L at most k. It turns out that you get a finitely generated algebra, which is a graded algebra because you have the degree of the Vronskian. And now in algebraic geometry, each time you have a graded algebra, you can take the so-called podge of this algebra to define a projective variety. In fact, it's over X here. So you can do this for all K. So in that way, you get a tower of projective vibrations, which I denote by y k of x, y k minus one of x. And of course, the, when k increases, the algebra increases. So it corresponds uh, in terms of schemes by mm, vibrations. Uh, because you take a proj, uh, you have a topological line bundle gk, which comes from the graded structure. And now the construction is completely functorial. Uh, doesn't depend on anything. It works for any projective manifold. And um, it turns out that the Vronskians give you special, uh, special differential operators if you take them globally. Um, they may not be all differential operators, but they are at least those which can be expressed in terms of polynomials of Vronskians. So this is essentially what you're interested in. So you take all polynomials in the Vronskians, but of course you're interested in those which take here negative values, which vanish on, on something ample. Okay. Now, remember that I have constructed, I've shown to you, well, it was probably too quick, but I have shown to you it was possible to construct a very, very large collection of Vronskians on a very special, on, on my very particular hypersurface. Uh, it turns out that for suitable choices of the, uh, of the combinatorics, then uh, these Vronskians, they generate 
degenerate your uh, your functorial uh, bundles. Um, in fact, because they generate for negative powers, you conclude that there is a, a product of them, so some weight that turns this uh, universal bundle into an ample one. But now ampleness uh, in algebraic geometry means positivity and positivity is an open condition. So if you are open, it means so ampleness is an open condition, and this thing is a universal object. So it's, it doesn't depend on any choice. It's just a universal object coming from Bronskians. Um, it's an open condition, and now it means that you can deform your particular example so that this will remain ample. But if it remains ample, it means that you have a lot of differential operators and then you conclude that the Kobayashi conjecture holds true. So this is the proof. So in some sense, the proof is reduced to just construction of a few determinants and observing that this, those determinants are divisible and then doing a little bit of linear algebra. So it's, it's not a very difficult proof. Um, it avoids, it avoids essentially any uh, deep theorem. Uh, even the vanishing theorem can be made completely elementary. It's only one variable theorem. Um, and essentially, you, you have to do a lot of linear algebra, which I've completely skipped, but, uh, but that's it. Now, of course, you would like to do better. You would like to prove the Grunge Pistolan conjecture, and I have some hints. But since I'm already over time, I will completely skip it. But let me just tell you that it could come from a use of holomorphic morphs inequalities. I have been able to show about 10 years ago that just with the assumption you're of general type, so you just assume general type, then you do have a lot of differential operators. So this, the first step is, is known. You, you know you have a lot but you don't know that they are independent enough. So somehow the, the existence of the differential operators is a, is a known fact now. It's highly non-trivial. It uses a lot of uh, stuff, uh, holomorphic morphs inequalities, but then it remains to do a lot to understand better the, the independence of the equations. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Let me stop here. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, are, are there any questions? Um, either, I think, speak up or, or in the chat if you're... Is there any... I, I had a one, one thing I was, I was curious about, if you think of the, the Ronskian, it's actually um, saying that your derivatives are less independent than they should be. And so they, this curve is being confined to some sort of hypersurface in, in some... Can, can the Ronskians get used, in other words, for the, the, the green uh, Griffiths line conjecture also? Yeah, well, in, in case of Ronskians uh, are mm, come from linear functions, so uh, let me come back to the uh, formula. Okay. So here it is. Okay. Oh, goes back. If we start by SJ are linear, then of course the vanishing of the Bronskian tells you that your curve is contained in a hyperplane. Hmm. Um, if 
the SJ are uh, more complicated, uh, the vanishing of this tells you that your curve is contained in the fact that these functions are proportional. So it, it will be contained in some, something of the forms sum of lambda j as j of s is zero. Okay, so you can directly relate uh, the vanishing of the Vronskan with the, uh, some equation satisfied by f. But um, this is uh, this is in fact well this is a simple case but uh, in general you don't know enough of this uh, this is for for functions uh, but here you have sections of line bundles and for line, for functions you would have this but for line bundles it goes much more complicated so you, you cannot argue exactly with this uh, but in fact uh, there have been simpler proofs especially by Alan Nadel uh, based for on this line of argument for surfaces. So for surfaces, of course, you need less steps. Uh, one equation is already a lot. So then you can, if you, it's a Vronsky and you can argue. So you can look at the, it's a very nice paper by Alan Nadel uh, around 1990. So then you can get a more elementary proof in that case. Okay, thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Um. Sir, question. Why the differential disappearance? Can you say it again? Why? Why? Pourquoi la différentielle de G? Um. Well, this uh, this is because. Uh, well, uh, what is a jet? A K jet of a curve, it simply means that you look at the Taylor expansion. So you, you, you assume that you are based at a point, okay? And then in coordinates, uh, you can look at the Taylor expansion. And of course, uh, this. Cj is simply uh, one over j factorial times the derivative of f by Taylor formula, and and then a, what is a k jet? It's an equivalence uh, of curves. So you, the curve should be tangent, tangent at very high order. So you 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 say you have a k jet uh, if you identify curves by neglecting the high order terms. Okay, so this is a k jet, and now you can view. You can view, you have a, um, a jet uh, space, which is simply a, a bundle of k-jet of curves. And in fact, the polynomial operators are simply functions on the k-jet bundle. So the, uh, the operators P uh, can be seen as functions on uh, the k-jet bundle. And this is why they are called uh, jet differentials. Of course, I have completely skipped this formalism because this is a colloquium, so I didn't want to, to introduce this heavy formalism. But if you want to be serious uh, with the proof, you probably need to, to enter into the formalism. Okay. Um, um, I'll make a comment. But it's not really on what what you did, but you you claim that I'm a number theorist. You claim that uh, rank is expected to go to infinity, but that's really changed in the last few years. So, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah. I think that on average it's known to be one half. So in some sense, um, the generically the rank is uh, zero one. Um, and in, in very rare cases, it goes to high number. I think the, the maximum value is, I don't know, it's, I don't know, I know 28 is possible, maybe louder values are possible now. I, I don't know, is there any known bound? Well, there's no known bound, but there are two heuristics that are mm -hmm. very different, and they both give very similar 
um, bounds, but are a bit, a bit complicated to explain. But um, Bjorn Poonen spoke at the ICM last time on mm -hmm. exactly this issue. So I just want to bring you up to date that that this it's not the first time that on this particular question of thinking swap from infinity to finite and back from finite to infinity, but now we believe finite again. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, well, it was just to mention that this this type of question is very hard already for elliptic curves. So, uh, um, so if you want to consider algebra, uh, arbitrary algebraic variety, of course, uh, it's going to be a huge challenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, if not, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Jean-Pierre for a, a wonderful talk and quite uh, very clear and, and uh, luminous on a, on a very, very complicated subject. So thank you very much. <laughs>